Greetings, my sweet summer children and other factors. My name is Sam, and today I have the uber nerdy pleasure of presenting this week's installment of 101 Facts on the thrilling topic of Game of Thrones again. Yes, the 101 Facts OGs will have already seen the first video we did on GOT back in 2016, but so much has happened in Westeros since then that we just couldn't help ourselves. So, bully for you guys, you're getting a tasty little part two. But which iconic Game of Thrones name have we been mispronouncing for years? Which Game of Thrones episode holds the coveted most watched top spot? And how can I stop myself from geek gasming all over this recording booth when I record this? Seriously guys, it's a debilitating medical problem. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so clear the sleep out of your eye, pull on your winter robes, and anticipate a violent and humiliating death at every corner, even though you have guessed right. Look into the fire and see us as Azora High as we go through 101 facts about Game of Thrones Part 2. Number 1. George R.R. R. Martin was inspired to write the novel series A Song of Ice and Fire, upon which Game of Thrones is based, after spending years becoming frustrated with writing TV scripts that never made it to the screen. This was due to restrictive TV budgets that forced him to diminish his stories in both vision and scope. This prompted him to return to novel writing, and in 1991 he began work on the story that would eventually become the source material for Game of Thrones. Number 2. Prior to the series being made, writer George R.R. R. Martin had been approached several times with plans to adapt his ongoing book series A Song of Ice and Fire into a movie. Martin rejected every single offer, believing his books were far too expansive to be condensed into a single puny film. Number 3. Martin was likewise sceptical of a potential film series which could quickly be cancelled were the first instalment to underperform, citing The Golden Compass, the film adaptation of Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy. Can't get anything past our George. Number 4. However, when series creators David Benioff and D.B. Weiss told him that they wanted to make a TV show out of his story, he was more intrigued. Martin tested the pair by asking him who they thought Jon Snow's mother could be. Martin didn't tell them whether or not their answer was correct, but it was nonetheless insightful and aware enough that Martin agreed to sell the rights to his magnum opus. Number 5. Martin has stated that when the show's creators originally began casting for the show, there were only two roles that he and the showrunners agreed upon instantly, Peter Dinklage for Tyrion Lannister and Sean Bean for Ned Stark. Martin said they never considered anyone but Dinklage for the role, and not a single other person read for that part. Seems like it was the right decision to me. Number 6. Dinklage, whose celebrated portrayal of Tyrion has delighted audiences and critics alike since the show began, actually almost turned down his now iconic role because it was in the fantasy genre. Despite being a fan of Benioff, Dinklage didn't want a really long beard and pointy shoes or to be typecast into a stereotypical dwarf role. It was only after this he was assured that Tyrion was a complex, formidable human being. Number 7. For years prior to working together on Game of Thrones, Dinklage has been very good friends with Lena Headey, the actress behind the vicked Cersei Lannister. The pair previously worked together on a TV pilot called Ultra and a film called Pete Smalls is Dead. And it was actually on the set of the latter film that Dinklage first read the pilot of Game of Thrones. He then subsequently recommended Hedy to David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. Number 8. In fact, Hedy and Dinklage are such good friends that whenever their shooting schedules line up, they often share an apartment and drive to set together. They are also frequently seen going to local pubs and restaurants to eat and hang out. I believe that's what the kids these days refer to as squid go squid goals? No, I meant squad goals. Number 9. Unfortunately though, Hedy has a far frostier relationship with actor Jerome Flynn, who plays Bronn on the show. Prior to being cast, Hedy and Flynn were in a relationship that ended so acrimoniously that each of them had a clause inserted into their contracts, stipulating that they were never to appear in the same scenes and must be kept apart on set. I'm sure the whole ordeal is horrible for them, but damn is it juicy for the rest of us. And that is the tea. Number 10. Professional whippersnapper Thomas Brody Sangster was 22 when he was cast as 13-year-old Jojen Reed. I bet he's had so much trouble buying booze at the self-service checkout in Tesco. What a nightmare. Number 11. English actor and cartoonist Cockney stereotype Danny Dyer has revealed that he auditioned for a role in Game of Thrones not twice, not once, but three times, and was rejected on every occasion. He stated that one of the roles he auditioned for was Piper, a steward for the Night's Watch, who is played instead by English actor Joseph Alton. Number 12. Shortly before rocketing to the height of fame and fortune, Moonlight actor Mahershala Ali, who has a great laugh by the way, check it out, <laughs> unsuccessfully auditioned for a role in Game of Thrones. Ali revealed on Jimmy Kimmel Live that the role he was up for was Zarozo and Daxos, which eventually went to Nonzo Anosi instead. Number 13. He also went on to state that he suspects the reason he wasn't cast in the show is that he messed up his audition by preparing a number of chair-based power moves and stances. 
However, when he arrived at the audition, he was made to sit on a high stool, which completely threw him off. <laughs> Relatable. Number 14. Veteran English actor Tom Hollander was reportedly offered the role of the truly dreadful Peter Baelish, also known as Littlefinger, but turned it down. A decision he apparently now regrets. Yeah, I'll bet. Number 15. Brian Cox, the Scottish actor, not the English physicist and former keyboardist of the Northern Irish pop rock band D-Ream, has revealed that he was offered a role pretty early on in Game of Thrones, but turned it down because the pay was too low. He has since stated that this choice was silly, as he's now a complete addict. To Game of Thrones, I hope, because otherwise that's dark. Number 16. Ewan Rayon thrilled and repulsed viewers in the role of the villainous Ramsay Bolton, but the Welsh actor originally auditioned for the far more virtuous role of Jon Snow. Rayon was the primary runner-up to play the bastard of Winterfell, and was thankfully later cast as Ramsay Bolton. Number 17. Similarly, Dutch actress Carice Van Outen, who plays the Red Priestess Melisandre, had previously been asked to audition for the role of Cersei Lannister. However, Van Outen was unable to do so because she was filming the 2011 Spanish horror film Intruders. Number 18. Also similarly, Northern Irish actor Conleth Hill, who plays the insightful eunuch Lord Varys in the show, originally auditioned for the role of Robert Baratheon, which ultimately went to Mark Addy. Robert Baratheon was in seven episodes before getting shivved by a wild boar, whereas Lord Varys has appeared in over 40 episodes, so turned out well in the end, eh, Conleth? Number 19. Interestingly enough, Conleth Hill's brother, Roland Hill, is behind a lot of the show's awesome sound effects, like this one. He has in fact won four Emmys for his work as the production sound mixer on Game of Thrones. Number 20. Additionally, Rory McCann, who plays the Hound, has a sister named Sally, who also works on the show, specifically in the wardrobe department. If you're on a show that's as huge as Game of Thrones, I'm sure you're bound to get some family reunions somewhere. Number 21. There are only three American-born actors in the show, the aforementioned Peter Dinklage, Jason Momoa as Dothraki leader Cal Drogo, and Rosabelle Laurenti Sellers as Oberyn Martell's bastard daughter Tyene Sand. This is mostly because fancy-themed shows require British accents by convention, and colonials tend to get their knickers in a twist attempting to imitate our dulcet tones. Dinklage kills it though, <laughs> love that guy. Number 22! Ooh, ooh. Oberyn Martell is played by Pedro Pascal, who is another American on the show, though he was actually born in Chile. His family fled the skinny South American nation shortly after his birth during the rise of the US-backed military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. His family eventually settled in America, and he is a US citizen who grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Number 23. George R.R. R. Martin has stated that he considers several of the show's characters to be improvements on the versions he wrote in the books, specifically mentioning Natalia Tennant's portrayal of Osha and Sibel Kikili's portrayal of Shay as examples. Number 24. Prior to filming the captivating first episode, the show's creators filmed a pilot that was, hmm, how to put it, uh, ill-received. It was in fact so bad that HBO ordered the creators to make significant cast and directorial changes and reshoot roughly 90% of the episode. What followed has been described by screenwriter Craig Mazin as the biggest rescue in Hollywood history, as the original pilot was, to quote, a complete pile of... Uh, poo. Number 25. According to Kit Harrington, the English actor who plays the sulky hero Jon Snow, his performance in the apparently god-awful Game of Thrones pilot was so bad that the creators sometimes jokingly threatened to upload the footage to YouTube if he gets on their nerves, and have even sent him screen grabs as reminders not to step out of line. Number 26. George R.R. R. Martin himself actually had a cameo in the rejected pilot. Martin betrayed a Pentoshi nobleman, who attends the wedding of Daenerys Targaryen to Khal Drogo, but when the pilot was remade, his appearance was completely removed. Sad times for George R.R. R. Number 27. While the show generally tries to remain largely faithful to the book, certain liberties are taken as part of the show's translation from book to TV. One example is composite characters, who are single characters in the show who are actually based on several different people in the books. Probably the most prominent such character is Roz, who is a composite of several <clears throat> ladies of the night, including Alayaya, Chataya, Kyra, and other unnamed characters from the book. Number 28. Ramin Javadi, the talented composer who produces all the music for Game of Thrones, has stated that the idea for the show's title theme music, which just to remind you goes that one on for way too long, just came to him after watching some visuals for the show, and that he simply hummed it into existence while he was driving to the studio, where he started to actually write the piece. Number 29. Each season of Game of Thrones is filmed between the months of July and December, with two units, nicknamed Wolf and Dragon, shooting concurrently in various different countries. In Season 3, production added a third unit labelled Raven, before resuming with two units for Season 4, and for Season 6, there was another third unit known as White Walker. Number 30. 
Only two actors in Game of Thrones appeared in every episode of the show before their characters died, Sean Bean as Eddard Ned Stark and Mark Addy as Robert Baratheon. Number 31. As you will no doubt already know, Game of Thrones is known for its sheer abundance of violent, violent deaths. This trend is so pronounced that Maester Aemon from The Night's Watch and the elderly servant Old Nan are the only two characters across the show's first seven seasons to die of natural causes. Number 32. As of season seven, only three people in the entire series have killed a White Walker. These brave souls are Jon Snow, Sam Tarly, and Mira Reed, who all achieve their feats using either dragon glass or Valerian steel. Number 33. Jon Snow also has the distinction of being the only character to have killed two White Walkers. <laughs> what a show off. Number 34. According to the show's sound designer, Paula Fairfield, Daenerys' dragon Drogon is designed to sound similar to her late husband, Cal Drogo. I've only just noticed they've basically got the same name just with an N on the end. This is because the sound team considers Drogon to be somewhat of a metaphorical reincarnation of Drogo. Well, I suppose she has ridden both of them. Number 35. In the show, the House of Lannister is well known for their frequently exalted motto, a Lannister always pays his debts, which is often used sarcastically to imply Lannisters always repay unkindness with more unkindness, to put it very, very lightly. In the books, though, the Lannisters' official motto is hear me roar, which is not really mentioned in the show so often. Number 36. Owing to her pretty reliable habit for wanton cruelty and murder, Cersei Lannister is considered one of the show's most hated characters. She is in fact so despised by viewers that Lena Headey, who is, I should remind you, an actress, is often the victim of fans who direct their hatred towards her character to her personally. She has stated she's been called unbroadcastable names, both online and in person, and that at conventions, people have actually snatched their books from her hands to prevent her from signing them. Wow. Number 37. Canonically, Daenerys actually has purple eyes. The original plan for the character was going to include this unique characteristic. However, the purple contact lenses actress Amelia Clarke had to wear were so uncomfortable that it affected her performance, and eventually the decision was made not to use them. Number 38. Less dramatically, Amelia Clarke is in fact a natural brunette, and has stated that she has never dyed her hair for the show. Daenerys Targaryen gets her flowing platinum blonde locks with the use of an elaborate wig and makeup system, which apparently takes considerable time and effort to install atop Clark's pretty little noggin. Number 39. However, that's all changing for the eighth season of Game of Thrones as Clark revealed on Instagram that she has dyed her hair this time round. Sadly though, Clark has stated in an interview with Harper's Bazaar that the dye job actually damaged her hair this time. I do respect an actor who suffers for their art. Number 40. Yara Greyjoy is actually named Asha in the books, but her name was changed for the TV series to avoid confusion with Osha. However, the character is still Asha in the German dubbed version, so if any Game of Thrones purists want to view the most faithful adaptation, I suggest you start loading Deutsch, baby. Number 41. Similarly, Lisa Aaron's son Robert is named Robin in the TV series to avoid confusion with Robert Baratheon, which is weird because there's about a thousand Johns and the Starks and the Car Starks. It's baffling. Anyway, without that name change, I certainly would have mixed them up. One's a stocky bearded king and the other is a creepy sport young boy who is way too old to be breastfed. Practically the same thing. The meaning of life. Hilariously, the furs worn by Jon Snow, Samuel Tarly, and the other little tykes of the Night's Watch aren't really furs or even fancy fake fur used in TV and film. Which you probably naively assumed, didn't you? No, the fur trimmings of the Night's Watch costumes are literally just rugs from Ikea. Not an ad for them, by the way. These fetching editions were expertly cut, shaved, waxed, and frosted to make them look as worn and authentic as possible. Number 43. According to David Peterson, the linguist behind the non-English languages of Game of Thrones, including Dothraki, we've all been pronouncing the most famous of Daenerys Targaryen's many titles incorrectly. The word Khaleesi, essentially meaning queen, should actually be pronounced more like Haleasi. Luckily, the far easier pronunciation prevailed, much to Peterson's annoyance. Number 44. Numerous well-known musicians have appeared on Game of Thrones as extras and background characters. In the ninth and penultimate episode of season three, for example, entitled The Reigns of Castamere, Coldplay drummer Will Champion portrayed one of the musicians at the infamous Red Wedding, who helps out with the infamous and still extremely upsetting massacre of Rob Stark, his wife, mother, and Bannerman, and unborn child. And Wolf. Ah. Uh. Number 45. The eighth episode of season five, the fan favorite entitled Hard Home, features appearances from three members of the heavy metal band Mastodon. In the episode, Bill Kelleher, Brent Hines, and Bran Daler star as wildlings who are gruesomely killed by white walkers and resurrected as whites. From Coldplay to Mastodon. Game of Thrones, everyone. Number 46. At the end of season five and the start of season six, Arya is blinded as a punishment for killing Meryn Trant, a cruel knight of the King's Guard. 
To achieve this, Maisie Williams, the actress who plays Arya, wore large and apparently very painful contact lenses through which she could not see. For fight scenes though, Williams wore lenses that allowed her to see, for safety reasons. Number 47. Before the release of Season 6 of Game of Thrones, former US President Barack Obama personally requested advanced copies of the new episodes so he could see it before everyone else. I guess Fox News was right about him all along, the crook. That's abuse of power, my friend. Number 48. During the play Arya watches in the fifth episode of Season 6, entitled The Door, one of the actresses says, I feel the winds of winter as they lick across the land. Which is a reference to the as-yet-unreleased sixth novel in the A Song of Ice and Fire series, entitled The Winds of Winter. Number 49. The ninth and penultimate episode of season six, entitled Battle of the Bastards, that's us to monetize, thanks guys, features an intense and bloody battle between Jon Snow and Ramsay Bolton for control of Winterfell. The episode was directed by Miguel Sapochnik. The episode was met with an immense swell of critical acclaim, with many calling it a masterpiece and one of the greatest moments in the history of television. Number 50. In order to shoot the 23 minute long battle, production required 600 crew members, 500 extras, 80 horses, 25 stuntmen and women, and 4 camera crews who are said to have filmed over the course of 25 gruelling days. Number 51. Heavy rain during filming the battle made the large field extremely muddy, which posed a problem as horses don't really like moving in mud. As a result, roughly 160 tons of gravel had to be brought in to give the animals some traction. Number 52. For the filming of the battle, a total of 257 bodies were used in the final pile of dead soldiers. Well, not real ones, of course. I hope. Number 53. Unlike many battle scenes, the Battle of the Bastards utilised very few aerial shots of the violence and bloodshed, which Sapochnik has stated was because HBO safety restrictions prevented the production from using camera drones over horses and people. Sapochnik decided upon a creative workaround by shooting most of the battle on the ground from the perspectives of John and Ramsay, giving a chillingly realistic viewpoint on medieval warfare. Number 54. As a result, the Battle of the Bastards is among the most expensive episodes of television ever made, with various estimates of its budget ranging from an incredible $10 million to a truly ridiculous $30 million. With that kind of money, you can buy an extremely large quantity of little piece of chicken breast encased in breadcrumbs and batter. Number 25. Many of you absolute sickos probably beheld Ramsay Bolton's grisly death scene with glee. Delighting as Sansa calmly watched his own hounds begin to eat him alive before she turns away. <sighs> Funnily enough though, VFX group Image Engine originally planned on making his demise even more graphic by using CGI to show Ramsay's jaw getting ripped off by his own hunting hounds. When they finished it though, they decided the effect was too gruesome even by Game of Thrones standards and scaled it back. Bearing in mind this is a show that smashed someone's head in and burned a small child alive. Number 56. The premiere episode of Season 7, entitled Dragonstone, sees the first appearance of Jim Broadbent in the role of Archmaester Ebros. Broadbent, who pops up in a further three episodes of Season 7, is the first Academy Award winning actor to appear in Game of Thrones. They finally nabbed an Oscar winner. Good on them. Number 57. Jim Broadbent is also one of several Harry Potter actors to appear on Game of Thrones too. Though unlike other such actors, Broadbent actually gets a sly reference to his Harry Potter role in the show. Many viewers believe that Archmaester Ebros keeping Samuel from accessing the restricted section to learn about the White Walkers is a nod to when Slughorn warns baby Dark Lord Tom Riddle against snooping around the restricted section of Hogwarts Library to research Horcruxes. Is it a reference or is it a plot similarity? Probably the second one. Number 58. In the season 7 premiere, famous ginger nut Ed Sheeran appeared as a Lannister soldier leading a sing-along around a campfire. Sheeran was invited onto the show as a surprise for Maisie Williams, who's a big fan of his. And I'm glad she enjoyed it because for everyone else that scene is just bizarre. Number 59. However, Sheeran also appeared in the episode as a method of getting the song Hands of Gold onto the show. The books themselves contain a number of important songs that have proved difficult to incorporate into Game of Thrones, as several actors have been reluctant to sing on screen. In one instance, Rose Leslie, who plays Egret, actually refused to sing the wildling song The Last of the Giants on camera. Orcs. Number 60. Sadly, however, certain portions of the Game of Thrones fanbase appeared either unaware or unbothered by this reasoning, and considered Sheeran's appearance on the show to be a needless celebrity cameo. The singer was so heavily harassed online that he made the decision to delete his Twitter accounts because people are awful. Number 61. Still, the appearance of celebrities in Game of Thrones remains a controversial topic. Christian Nairn, the burly Northern Irishman who portrayed the tragically lovable Hodor on the show, has since claimed that such cameos are stupid and take you right out of the world. But what do you think though? Are these cameos a good way to include more of George R.R. R. Martin's neglected lore? Or is the appearance of popular musicians just too jarring to include in the show? Let us know in our snazzy GOT YouTube poll. Number 62. The fourth episode of season seven entitled The Spoils of War is the shortest installment in Game of Thrones history. 
with a running time of just 50 minutes. Sucks to be you, Game of Thrones fans, in August of 2017. Number 63. The sixth episode of season seven, entitled Beyond the Wall, was accidentally made available to watch on demand by HBO Spain and HBO Nordic four days before its official release, and was viewable for an entire hour before it was removed. While hackers have leaked Game of Thrones episodes before, this was entirely HBO's own fault. Nintendo 64. The seventh episode of season seven, entitled The Dragon and the Wolf, is the longest episode of the series to date, with a hefty running time of 76 minutes and 43 seconds, surpassing the puny 71 minute runtime of the previous episode, entitled Beyond the Wall. Or as I like to call it, Gendry's Midnight Runners. Number 65. This episode attracted 12.1 million viewers in the live TV broadcast, with 16.5 million viewers across all platforms, making it the most viewed episode in the history of HBO. Number 66. Kit Harrington was apparently in a bar once. That's not the fact, by the way, that's the beginning. I just, sorry, I had to stop for a breath. When he was approached by a stranger who told him he looked exactly like Jon Snow. Ooh. When Harrington then revealed that he was in fact Jon Snow, the stranger told him he was too short. Hey, short people can be cool too, you know. I imagine, because I'm six foot. Number 67. Kit Harrington has also admitted that he used the cliffhanger of Jon Snow's multi-stabbing to avoid a speeding ticket. The officer asked Harrington to tell him whether Jon would be alive in the next episode or he'd get booked. Kit sang like a canary. That officer, is that corru that feels like corruption. Is that corruption? Number 68. Interestingly enough, Yara Greyjoy and Jon Snow used to work out together. Gemma Whelan, who plays Yara, told Games Radar that she's known Kit Harrington for years. And before they were both cast on the show, they would go to yoga together. Ah. Number 69. While we're on the subject of him, Harrington is actually the descendant of one of the greatest thinkers Britain has ever produced. This is because Harrington is in fact distantly related to Sir John Harrington, last name is the clue, the inventor of the modern flush toilet, to whom we all owe a great debt. Thank you, Mr. Toilet Man. Number 70. But Harrington isn't the only cast member who's descended from greatness. Una Chaplin, who played Talisa McGear on the show before, well, you know, is the granddaughter of the comedy legend Charlie Chaplin. The most famous person in my family is me and all I get is rude comments. Number 71. In July of 2017, Ben Hawkey, the English actor who plays the appropriately named Baker Hot Pie, opened up a real-life Game of Thrones-themed pop-up bakery in London in partnership with the food delivery service Deliveroo. The bakery, which was cleverly named You Know Nothing John Doe, sells the much-improved direwolf bread featured in the show for only £1.30 a pop. Number 72. Back in the early days of Game of Thrones, Joffrey and Sansa actually used to rap together between shots. Sophie Turner revealed that she would do her best to beatbox, and Jack Gleason, the actor who portrays everyone's favourite gasping corpse, would rap over the beat. Number 73. According to Macy Williams, George R.R. R. Martin's wife once said that she would leave him if she ever killed off Arya or Sansa. Talk about emotional blackmail. Number 74. Co-showrunner David Benioff is married to actress Amanda Peet, who similarly warned her husband that she would end the relationship if he killed off Jon Snow. Which, you know, he did. Kind of. Number 75. Maisie Williams has a tattoo on her neck that reads, No One, likely a reference to Aya's time spent training to become an efficient little bundle of murder she's blossoming into. Number 76. Amelia Clarke also has a badass Game of Thrones tattoo in the form of three dragons etched onto her wrist, which she got after filming her final scenes as Daenerys Targaryen. Number 77. Lena Headey and Amelia Clarke have both played female action icon Sarah Connor from the Terminator franchise. Lena Headey starred as Connor in the 2008 Terminator TV show Terminator The Sarah Connor Chronicles, while Amelia Clarke portrayed her in the horribly misspelt 2015 film Terminator Genisys. Number 78. Outside of being an actress on Game of Thrones, Maisie Williams is also a pretty talented dancer, and studies at Bath Dance College when she's not filming. A girl can throw some serious shapes. Number 79. Williams has even stated that dancing is her first love and not acting. Well, at least she has that to fall back on if being one of the most recognisable actors on the planet doesn't work out for her. Number 80. George R.R. R. Martin was once asked if watching the series has changed his approach when writing certain characters. He stated that the only performer who prompted him to rethink the character was Natalia Tenner, whose portrayal of Osha was younger, more attractive and more dynamic than the version of the character that Martin had initially written. Martin then stated when Osha comes back into the story, as I hope she will, I'm definitely going to take that into account. Number 81. With that in mind, Martin also stated in a 2017 interview with Metro that he stopped watching Game of Thrones after the first few seasons due to his busy schedule of writing and touring. Pfft, fake fan. Number 82. It may shock you to learn that George R.R. R. Martin is actually a skilled chess player. 
Okay, so maybe not that shocking, but Martin genuinely is very, very talented at chess. In university, Martin was both the founder and captain of the chess club, and for three years was actually able to pay the bills with winnings from chess tournaments, giving him plenty of time to write. So, in a very roundabout way, you can thank chess for Game of Thrones. Thanks, chess. Number 83. When Daenerys married Khal Drogo, Illyrio Mopatis gave her three ancient dragon eggs that would later hatch into the terrifying winged lizards that we all know and love today. The egg props, however, were actually given to George R.R. Martin in 2011 as a wedding gift. Number 84. As of 2018, Game of Thrones has won a staggering 47 Emmy Awards, more than any other scripted series in history. Number 85. In fact, the only show ever with more Emmy wins than that is the live variety series Saturday Night Live, which currently has 54 Emmys. However, it took SNL 39 seasons to gain the title in 2013, while Game of Thrones has won all its awards in the space of only 7 seasons. Number 86. As of February 2019, Game of Thrones is the first TV series in history to appear on the front cover of the film magazine Oh <laughs> my voice, do you me? Empire, who justified their decision to dedicate the cover of the 360th issue to the show due to its cinematic aesthetic and enormous scale. Empire has also stated they don't plan on featuring another TV show on their front cover anytime soon, simply because there's never been a TV show quite like Game of Thrones. Number 87. In 2018, several of the show's most prominent characters appeared on the UK's Royal Mail postage stamps. These characters include Daenerys Targaryen, Jon Snow, Tyrion Lannister, Arya Stark, Cersei Lannister, and Elena Tyrell. Other stamps featured the Night King, Direwolves, Dragons, and the Iron Throne. Number 88. In October 2018, Indonesia's President Joko Widodo used the tagline Winter is Coming when speaking at the International Monetary Fund World Bank Annual Meeting Plenary in Bali. This was to urge unity in the global economic community. Number 89. In March of 2019, Amelia Clark revealed in an article that she wrote for The New Yorker that shortly after she finished filming the very first season of the show in 2011, she suffered a life-threatening brain aneurysm that required her to undergo surgery. The recovery process was so tough that at one point, Clark was unable to remember her own name. Number 90. As if that wasn't horrendous enough, Clark was also forced to have surgery again in 2013 to treat a second aneurysm, for which the recovery was apparently even worse than the first. Now, usually I would dedicate an episode to Jennifer Lawrence because, you know, <laughs> she's Jennifer Lawrence. But after this news, Emilia Clarke deserves it, man. I take my hat off to you. You are a badass. Badass, I mean, English. Number 91. In 2015, Game of Thrones became the very first TV series in history to be screened in IMAX theatres. When HBO screened the last two episodes of season 4 plus a special season 5 trailer in roughly 150 such theatres around the United States. Number 92. In April of 2016, a new channel launched in Israel called the Game of Thrones channel, which, as you probably already surmised, is devoted entirely to Game of Thrones. Throughout the day, the channel airs not only episodes, but also interviews, behind-the-scenes videos, and special features, all in preparation for Season 6. The Game of Thrones channel constituted the first time in Israeli TV history that a complete channel was dedicated to only one show. Number 93. Next level Game of Thrones nerds may be interested to know that you can actually take a Game of Thrones class at the prestigious Harvard University. The class delves into the real medieval history from which George R.R. R. Martin and the show's creators draw inspiration, using archetypal characters from the show to examine real-world analogues from history. Number 94. And that wasn't the first time Game of Thrones found itself the focus of sincere academic scholarship. In 2017, UC Berkeley offered a six-week course inspired by the fictional tongues of the show, entitled The Linguistics of Game of Thrones and the Art of Language Invention. The class was taught by linguist David Peterson, who you may remember from earlier on in the video is the dude who created the show's Dothraki and High Valerian languages. Number 95. In 2016, two mathematicians named Andrew Beveridge and Jai Shan published a paper in MAA's Math Horizons, which sought to uncover the most interconnected character in the series. The paper, lovingly entitled Network of Thrones, claims that Tyrion interacted with the most characters, and they concluded that he is in fact the true protagonist. However, their analysis did focus entirely on the third book in the series, entitled A Storm of Swords, which may have ever so slightly skewed the results in Tyrion's favour. Number 96. It's since been confirmed that season 8 of Game of Thrones, which will premiere very, very soon, will sadly be the final season of the series. It will consist of only six episodes, though several of those will be substantially longer than usual. Number 97. Both George R.R. R. Martin and HBO have stated they would have happily extended the series beyond its planned 73 episodes, but the decision was ultimately left to what David Benioff and D.B. Weiss thought would be best for the series. Number 98. Without revealing anything, George R.R. R. Martin has stated that some fans will have correctly guessed how the series will end, concluding that at least one or two readers had put together the extremely subtle and obscure clues that had planted in the books. Number 99. 
Of course, it's entirely possible and perhaps even likely that the series could end with nobody winning the right to sit atop the Iron Throne. Some people have even suggested that all the remaining characters and everybody in the Seven Kingdoms may be killed by the Night King and involuntarily conscripted into his army of half-frozen zombies. I love a happy ending. Number 100! Prior to the final season of the show, HBO launched the Bleed for the Throne campaign in the US. Constituted by six days of coordinated donating from fans across 43 states and nine colleges and universities across the nation between the 7th and 12th of March. The event, which was described as the largest blood donation promotional effort by an entertainment company in American Red Cross history, rewarded generous fans with an exclusive Bleed for the Throne t-shirt and automatic entry into a competition to win a trip to the season 8 world premiere of Game of Thrones. Number 101, 1111. HBO later stated that they were considering several spin off shows, and in 2018 it was confirmed that a Game of Thrones successor show was being produced. The show will be set in the Age of Heroes, which occurred roughly 10,000 years or so before the events of Game of Thrones. Naomi Watts has been confirmed so far, but all I can say is put Jennifer Lawrence in it, you cowards. So that was 101 more facts about Game of Thrones. Blimey, you lucky people, and yet there's still stuff we've probably missed. Would you like to see part 3? Who will sit atop the Iron Throne in your opinion? Let me know in the comments down below. Also give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already. 411,000 people can't be wrong now, can they? In the meantime though, look at this end board. Wow! It's hot stuff. And there's two videos on there you're gonna really love. One a quick and one and, you know, creepy right. And so he spoke, and so he spoke. Bye!